Next up is Judith Dexamer. She is with the Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center, where she is the Associate Professor, UC Department of Pediatrics. Please join me in welcoming Judith. Thank you. Hi, so thank you everybody for coming and for staying out because I am pretty sure the afternoon is beautiful and um, we aren't outside. But so I want to give kind of a brief introduction about myself before I get started. So I'm, I'm Judith Dexheimer. I do pediatric research. And so I'm very friendly because pediatricians are very friendly. But what I want to tell you is a little bit about myself. I'm not a pediatrician, but I work with them. Is that I am actually a introvert, but in the land of informatics, I appear to be an extrovert. And so I'm going to do my best today. So the first thing I want to do is audience participation. And I want to ask, who used to be a kid? You can, you can raise your hand. I'll raise my hand. And so who is still a kid? So excellent. So what I wanted to answer first and foremost is why would we study pediatrics? And that easy answer is because everybody was a kid once. And everybody begins to grow up. And so what happens in pediatrics is sometimes little kids get sick. And part of what we want to do when a child gets sick is detect whatever their disease or illness is as early as possible, because an earlier detection could lead to an improved quality of life. And so another issue that appears in pediatrics all the time is medications. So for the first couple of slides, you're going to be patients and you are going to have strep throat and go to your provider and say, you know what, I think I need something. I think I need an antibiotic. So we're going to do this with a pediatric patient as well. And so your child is going in, and they're sick, and they need something. But one of the problems with medications in pediatrics is that when they're tested in clinical trials, they're not tested on kids. But they're still prescribed to children and so from the machine learning side, there's a wealth of information living in an electronic health record all about what a medication does and any possible adverse offense, events that a child might have had taking it that could later be mined that aren't collected when they're talked about originally and tested. And then the most important thing that I want to stress during my 30 minutes today of talking to you is that healthy kids lead to healthy adults. So if we can make healthier kids, then we can make an overall healthier population. So I mentioned I was at a pediatric hospital. And so what I want to show you on this slide here is that we don't just have pediatric patients. We also have pediatric providers. Um, the real answer is this is my son, Stephen, learning to wash his hands at a science center. And so what is pediatrics? Just so that there's a broad definition so that everybody's on the same page. And it's basically the medical care of infants, children, and adolescents. And so one-fifth of the United States are pediatric patients. So they're under the age of 18. And so one of the challenges in pediatrics and with pediatric data is the age-based variability. So the example I have up here is if you when you're presenting with strep throat and you have a fever of 100.8 degrees, what do you do about it? Do you take some Tylenol and maybe go back to bed? If it's your kid, what do you do? Do you take them in to see their doctor? Do you call their pediatrician? Do you call your own doctor? What if it's your child who's under 28 days of age, and so it's a neonatal child? That child needs to have a call to their pediatrician and likely needs to go to the emergency department. So this is one data point that has very different things that may happen depending on who you are and how old you are. And then the second, so, hmm, start again. So then the second example I want to give you here goes back to those medications. So medication dosing in pediatrics is based on a patient's weight. So once you're, say, an adolescent, you're a teenager, you're an adult, and you go in and say, I have strep throat, and your provider agrees and says, you know what, we're going to give you an antibiotic. 
you get a couple of pills and you go home with them and you are in charge of taking them. On the pediatric side, when they go to write that prescription, they're gonna take the child's weight and they're gonna look at your weight and they're gonna say, here's how much you should be taking and how often you should be taking it. So again, one action that's gonna have various consequences depending solely on your age. So this is our hospital. This is our new T building. It's currently named the T building. If you know anyone who would like to provide some money to help give it a new name, please let us know. But this is part of the place where we do research in the hospital. And so what are some of these interaction layers that are different in pediatrics when it comes to doing care and recording the notes that we're going to talk about in just a minute? One of them is there are multiple historians for medical histories. So you as the patient, get to say, this is what I'm feeling, this is what's happening, you know, please record all of this in the chart so I know what's happening. But when you bring in a child, the caregivers may have something to say, be that mom or dad or somebody else. Family members may be there and may have something to say as well, and they may have an opinion to give on what's happening with the child. And then once your child's an adolescent or maybe 10 or 11 years old, they have their own opinions. The child in the last picture is 11, my son Stephen. He has his own opinions now. He wants to participate in his care as well. And so this brings us to who performs the patient's treatments. Is it mom? Is it dad? Is it the kid themselves? Again, you, with your antibiotic, know that you need to take it two times a day or not. Or you need to tell your child that it's time to drink that little pink liquid and make sure that they stay compliant with their care. And then the last thing that I wanna talk about on the pediatric side is that there's a dynamic patient history due to their developmental stages. So an adult has a fairly static trajectory. You can guess that I am going to be about the same in two years as I'm going to be right now. But if I wanna bring in a three-year-old, they're going to be very different in two to three years and they should have started school and they should have a lot of growth and there are some underlying genetic changes. And so all of these things need to be taken into account when starting to look at some of their medical data. So let's start with the electronic health record. Again, so that everyone is on the same page probably you have had an interaction with the electronic health record in your life. What's in it? Everything about your hospital visit now. Your chief complaint, so why you came in for your visit that day, your temperature, because you had your temperature taken when you walked in the room, your weight, so that they can compare it to last year and say, how are you doing? But it also has all of your provider notes, all of their communications with you, it has all sorts of fabulous and rich information being used for clinical care, being used for billing, being used for communication among all of your care team. So what's important about electronic health records is there are more than 300 EHR vendors in the United States. 75% of hospitals report using an EHR or have one installed, and more than 80% of pediatricians report using one when they do care in patients. So there's a lot of data that's being created all the time. So what's in there on the terms of data types, just so we know what we're working with? The first is quantitative data. Those are the structured data. So when you go in and have your temperature taken and your respiratory rate, those are structured data. Those are stored in the EHR. When you have a diagnosis, when you leave your visit, it's a coded diagnosis. That's what's sent off for billing, but that also tells you later why you're there. And then the other part of data in the EHR is qualitative. So these are data that are unstructured. These are all those clinical notes. And if you go to a teaching hospital, those may be notes from your medical student, your attending provider, your fellow physician, and even your resident physician, and they're all going to be about your treatment today. They also have all of the communications with you and any other side notes that may have been taken. So the answer is, there's a lot of data all the time. And so what I wanted to do was try to tie electronic health record data back in with big data. So I got really interested in when was the term big data defined? The answer is 1997 in NASA. 
And big data is just when data sets do not fit in main memory or when they don't fit even on the local disk. That's it. That's what started us down this whole big data set. And that's where our new term came from. So basically, they're extremely large data sets. And so I think the natural extension to that is, is the electronic health record big data. So we're one pediatric hospital with a catchment area that's roughly Cincinnati, Ohio. What's important about us is that we have about 1.3 million patient encounters annually, so they touch our hospital at any point in time. We have an EHR that was installed in 2009, and before that we actually had another one. So we've had this one about 10 years, and it has about 45 million patient, individual patient encounters in it. This accounts for about eight terabytes of data that we're storing around at the hospital that's both clinical data and research data. We are small when you compare us to something like Kaiser that might stretch across all of California. So the point is that electronic health records are big data, and there's a lot of it there to be used. So what can we do with big data in healthcare? So we just talked about that there are large amounts of patient data stored in EHRs. All of your visit data is always there for you to access again. And with the widespread digitalization of healthcare, so if you have a fitness tracker, if you have a heart rate monitor, there's the idea that all of these will come in and interact with your healthcare eventually to help guide your care. So there's an exponential amount of data continuing to increase and be added into the EHR that could help possibly make better decisions. So it's a potentially rich source for research and data mining. And what's one last thing is up to 80% of the data being stored in the electronic health record are unstructured. So in the terms of informatics, they're untapped. So what we have is just at our hospital, more than 10 years of data, and no provider has time to go read through 10 years of patient notes or 20 or 30 before every single patient visit that comes in. What we want to do in the land of informatics is we want to help providers. So the fundamental theorem of informatics is that the computer and the provider together should be able to perform better than the provider alone. Are we ever going to replace providers with computers? No. I'm, I'm sorry, this is not the right conference for that, but it's not going to happen because we have a lot of different provider discussions that need to happen as time goes on. So I want to do a very brief overview about, because I'm academic, machine learning in the literature. So I did a search on PubMed in October for machine learning and medical informatics, and I got 8,324 hits. I'm not going to show you all of them. And then I said, you know what, let's see how much machine learning is being done in pediatrics, since that's my field. And I did the same search again, and I said machine learning in pediatrics, and I got 466 hits. So we have a long way to go. And there's a lot of machine learning being done in a lot of different places. But we have more we could do, and there's a lot of untapped things in pediatrics. So I'm going to talk about some of the things we've done at Cincinnati Children's, but we are by no means the only people doing pediatric research. So I wanted to make sure I highlighted some of the things that are happening in pediatric research that aren't just what I'm going to talk about today, which is epilepsy. And so this is a review that's the idea here that I'm just trying to show you is that there's enough information out there to start doing review articles and start putting it all back together. In this paper, they focused on detecting sepsis in pediatrics, something that's also very challenging and not very well done all the time in adults because the data are very difficult to get to. This paper looked at children transferring in the pediatric intensive care unit. So these are the sickest patients in the hospital, and the idea here is exactly the, if we can predict who's going to transfer, maybe we can prevent it from happening. 
This one looks at predicting appendicitis when a patient comes into the emergency department. So if we predict who may come in with appendicitis, can we also start their care earlier and maybe reduce the number of appendices that we need to remove? And then what I'm gonna focus on today is the work we've done on detecting patients with epilepsy who may be eligible for neurosurgical consultation and ultimately for neurosurgery. So I'm gonna give just one slide of background on epilepsy. And the idea here is that epilepsy is one of the leading neurological disorders in the United States. There are more than 480,000 children who have epilepsy and more than two million adults. I think that most people probably have a little bit of experience and have at least heard of epilepsy, so I have a definition here for you. But basically, children, adults have seizures, and these can be controlled with medication and other treatment in most cases. 30% of epileptic patients are intractable, which means they're not well controlled with treatment. It also means that they've had at least two trials of appropriate anti-epileptic medications, and that those trials have failed to adequately control their seizures. So of the children who are intractable and eligible for neurosurgery, 55% to 59% of them are seizure-free after surgery. So it can be a life-changing, great experience for the correct kids. And of those, 77% report improved quality of life because they report improved seizures or decreased seizures. So we want to be able to find these kids. And the national average for pediatrics from time to diagnosis with, diagnosis with epilepsy to being sent for neurosurgical evaluation is eight years. The average in adults is 20 years. And the average for our patient population at Cincinnati Children's is six years. So what did we do? We developed a natural language processing algorithm, and these are going to be a lot of the papers that we have that came out about it, uh, designed to identify patients who may be eligible for a neurosurgical consult. So Dr. John Pestian's lab sat down with neurosurgery, neurology, informatics, and computer science, and in a collaborative environment said, what can we do to help identify some of these patients? So they examined linguistic changes over time in epilepsy clinical progress notes. What's important in everything we talk about here is that it is entirely clinical progress notes alone. It is all unstructured. It is not structured data at all. So what they wanted to do was look at the linguistic changes over time in these progress notes and see if there's a change. Can we detect a change? Can we tell when a kid's gonna be sent to surgery versus a kid who's never gonna be sent to surgery? And so the long-term goal here is to reduce the time to initial surgery evaluation and hopefully send kids earlier. So what we did and here's kind of the way it works for a child. Here across the bottom, years one to year 10, this is a child's disease progression with epilepsy. This purple line on top is a neurologist language of intractable epilepsy. This blue line on the bottom is the neurologist language of non-intractable epilepsy. And it's a natural progression that the neurologist is following for all of their patients as they treat them. Each of these little E's represents our patients' visits with the neurology clinics. So you can see that we start with the light blue E's and the patient is non-intractable, so they are well controlled with medication and they're doing a great job and they are happy and they have a good quality of life. And as this patient progresses in their care with their disease, they slowly move up to being intractable. At year six, in their classic clinical care, they are sent for surgery and their care progresses and moves on. But with the natural language processing we developed in the last slide, we can find these kids looking at all of our retrospective data two years earlier. So we could potentially send them two years earlier and that's a big deal for a little kid. That's a big deal for all adults. 
So we did this, and we wanted to evaluate it prospectively. Like, how good of a job does it actually do when it's applied in the clinic on a day-to-day -day basis? So what we did was every week on Sunday night, we looked at all of our neurology patients who were coming in. We have about 6,000 visits a year. And we said, which of these children are coming in that may have intractable epilepsy? Which of these would we want to alert a provider and say, hey, have you thought about sending this kid for surgery evaluation? So we had two neurologists review all of the children that the system identified. So we knew that they were board certified. They would be the people the kids saw in the end anyway. And so what we see is that for these results, we did a pretty good job. 82% area under the curve. It looks pretty nice. We got a lot of kids identified that we may not have already seen. We have a pretty low positive predictive value, which seems kind of like a problem. And part of this is because when you look at the entire population of 6,000 kids, there aren't really that many that are surgery eligible. And our, at our institution, we do pretty close to about 50 surgeries a year, so it's not an exceedingly common thing to have done. And then the last thing I want to point out here is the number needed to screen is 3.6, or about 4. So what this means is that it's the number of people that need to be screened during our given duration or time to prevent one death or one adverse event. So basically, for every four people that we screen, one patient is definitely eligible for surgical consult and should be sent on to have a surgery workup. A surgery workup, by the way, takes somewhere from three to six months. So we are not rushing these children into surgery. We are saying, let's send you to some more experts and make sure you're really a great candidate for it. And an important thing about finding the children earlier is that for each year that someone is sent prior to surgery, if they are eligible, it's a 1.5% decrease in all-cause mortality. So in theory, we're helping these kids, giving them a better quality of life, and also decreasing mortality, which, as the informaticist, I think is a very fair trade-off for a handful of probably incorrect alerts. So let's talk about when we're wrong, because we're not always right. So here in the pie chart, two-thirds of the time, we're right. And the other third of the time, we're incorrect, and this child wasn't eligible for surgery. So part of what we asked the providers to do was say, of all these people who aren't eligible for, for surgery, why weren't they? Like, what can we do with those information? Some of these. Um, are they wouldn't improve the quality of life. And so the algorithm isn't necessarily wrong here, but it's not something that a provider would do and they wouldn't send them. Another one, it's unclear if the patient's actively having seizures. Again, data that can be collected during that day's visit that maybe they don't have. And so this is something that can feed into future algorithmic predictions the next time the patient comes in. Medical contraindications are an easy one for us to say, we need to update our algorithm, we need to make sure patients who have these never get surgery referrals. And then there is always here at the bottom is the family declined surgery evaluation, which is social reasons, which are frequently not collected in electronic health records. So what can we do next with all these great data? Building the natural language processing isn't the end of development. Testing it without being in clinical care isn't the end of development. And so what we want to do is first improve the classifier. We can always make it better. And we did everything with unstructured data, but maybe adding structured data back in would really improve its performance some more. Another is to fully integrate it with clinical care, which we've done and is currently running. So provide those reminders, those alerts to the clinicians at the point of care and say, hey, have you talked about this with your patient? And if you don't want to, could you tell us why not? Another one is potentially to expand to other hospitals. We have data showing that 
looking at linguistics across pediatric hospitals, they match, so we'd be able to take our algorithm and port it somewhere else and get an even better data set to make better predictions. And the last one is to evaluate our algorithm. I think you're going to hear a lot more about this in the next talk, but I wanted to briefly address machine learning bias because I feel like this is kind of the elephant in the room in terms of machine learning. So what happens in the news is there are a lot of articles about why brand new machine learning applications have been scrapped because they're biased. And so this made us think, what if ours is biased? There's some known biases in epilepsy surgery referrals that are published in the literature. So the question is, why is an algorithm biased? Is it the underlying data? Could it be the algorithm itself? Could it be something else we haven't thought about? So what we wanted to do was evaluate ours because we don't want to be giving the providers any kind of biased information when it's something that we could discover, we could find, and that we could fix before we gave out those alerts and reminders. So we did a study and published it be, because we're academics. And so the question is, is our machine learning biased? The things that had a statistically significant effect on surgical candidacy scores were the distance traveled to our hospital, so the distance from their home to our hospital, whether or not the patient had public insurance, all children are covered by Medicare, so everyone at our hospital has insurance in a fashion, and age greater than 18 years of age. These all fit typical standard epilepsy referrals to a hospital. Patients who are over than eight, older than 18 years of age probably have a lot of comorbid conditions and have been seen for other reasons as well. And the fact that they're still coming to a pediatric hospital suggests they may be sicker anyway. And then distance traveled, we're a specialty hospital, people get referred in, so people come in to see us. And so this is great news for us, but what about things that we're worried about? Race, gender, ethnicity, language, that might actually affect what providers are doing without realizing it. So things that had no statistically significant effect on surgical candidacy scores created by the algorithm were race, gender, and primary language. This is again great news for us, and while I think that there's always a chance for machine learning to be inherently biased, I think it's just as important to check it as you go to make sure that what you have is sound and is good. So what have we learned today? Or rather, what have I didactically shouted at you today? One of them is that we can improve pediatric care with unbiased machine learning algorithms. Another is that big data is here to stay because there's always going to be more information coming into the EHR, and there's always going to be additional information being brought in from other places. What I want you to go home with today is that healthy kids will lead to healthy adults. So if we do our work on the pediatric side, then we can create a better population as all of these children turn into adults. And what does the future hold for this research? So one of the things is that there's more opportunities for machine learning development and implementation. So again, as academics, we're always looking for collaborations. We would be happy to work with you, but a thing that's very important is that all I've presented here today is one disease in a very narrow field and doesn't even begin to touch everything that might be happening in healthcare that we could find using these data. But another thing that's very important to note is that looking across larger data sets and larger hospitals, so in the terms of epilepsy, there are so many adults who are also suffering with this disease, and we're only looking at 20% of the population. So if we expand to that other 80%, will our algorithm still work? Will we be able to find more patients and also give them an improved quality of life? We're looking at 20 years instead of six years, so maybe it'll be easier to find them earlier. And then the last thing is sharing data. So basically a learning health system. 
We want to take data, if we have everybody we could possibly have in the population, we would make a better inference and a better prediction. So in my last 30 seconds, what I want to do is thank everybody for coming, but I also want to point out that in a very important thing in research is that research isn't possible without large collaborative teams and institutions. There's no way to do research without a wide variety of people helping you out, without those working with you. John Pestian's been a valuable collaborator without having support and without working with other people. And so all of those people are very important and should be thanked as well. Thank you.